Hi, everybody. Welcome. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Ed Friedman. I chair Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Uh, <coughs> it's apparent that everyone loves bats more than they love sea lamprey. We only had about a dozen people here for a really fantastic sea lamprey talk. So, hope to put it online at some point, but it was really, really interesting, and they are uh, they are a really cool critter. And we think of sturgeon as being living dinosaurs, but sturgeon are only about 250 million years old. Sea lamprey go back about 450 million years. So they've got a pretty good um, ecological recipe to survive that long. For those of you that don't know, and I think there are a lot of you, um, I want to tell you a little bit about Friends of Marine Meeting Bay, and then I'm going to introduce our, our speakers tonight. Um, we are a unique organization in that we are a membership organization, um, but we, do a, we look at environment in a holistic fashion, and the bay, which is kind of right down that way. Um, we do research, we do advocacy work, uh, we do a lot of education, and we are a land trust. We protect land. So by way of example, um, done a, and, and you'll see around here these trifold things that illustrate some of what I'm talking about. Some, uh, a really intense four-year circulation study project in the bay using these homemade drifters with GPS units in them and uh, radios in them so we could find them again and redeploy. Um, learned a lot about the bay. Uh, we've done a bunch of archaeology around the bay. Uh, we've done sediment uh, surveys for toxins. Um, we often use our research as a guide for our advocacy. So, for instance, the bay empties out via the Chops and the Kennebec, 200-meter bedrock slot in Woolwich and North Bath. And uh, there was a move to put a big hydro, uh, uh, tidal energy project in there. 40 underwater windmills, speaking of windmills, we'll talk about that tonight some. Uh, uh, 40 foot wide, I think they were, they were, maybe it's 20, 28, it's been a while, but uh, right in the middle of the chops, where every migratory fish has to pass through to get up into this very, very unique system. And our group was the only one to say, bad idea. And we used our circulation data to help support our advocacy in that. Everyone else said, well, the bay is a special place, we need to go slow, be careful, and we're looking at like, you know, 50 years of legal battles once it gets going. So it was like, no, bad idea. We weren't the only ones, actually. The other folks to say no were the company's competitor who wanted to put their units in. So, so we do a lot of work on fish passage, um, working down uh, with the Friends of Sebago Lake right now on the Presumpscot River, where there's been a bad deal to take down a dam in Westbrook that, in exchange for doing a Cadillac dam removal job, would cut off all migratory fish passage to the upper probably three quarters of the watershed. <clears throat> so several dams between there and Sebago Lake and one of the, at one of those there would be no more fish passage. So that would be that. So um, education, we uh, work with probably 2,000 kids a year. Uh, in school visits, we've got a great uh, stable of taxidermy critters. Um, keep them in the Bodenham Library if you're, if you're in the area and want to check them out. And we take kids outside and get them really dirty twice a year at Bay Day. Uh, once in the spring in Woolwich on Chop Point and once in the fall uh, in the game management area in Bodenham on the Bay. So way too much screen time for kids. They know it or they don't know it, but in either case it's so. And they just love being outside. And when kids are doing a real archaeology dig and finding you know, musket balls or arrowheads or pieces of glass, it's like, they say, I don't want to stop. I want to be an archaeologist. You know, so most of us that are interested in this stuff had a formative experience like that when we were young, and we hope to pass on some of that. Protected over 1,500 acres of land around the bay, about 12 miles of waterfront. Um, still working on that. Just finished a conservation easement a couple of months ago. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, it's our members and volunteers that really make it all happen. We have typically one staff person. I'm a volunteer chair. Um, so an event like Bay Day might have 40 or 50 volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering, I think there's a spot on the sign-up sheet that's going around to check, check yes or something. Yeah, that'd be great. And that sheet is two-sided, by the way. 
helps give us an idea of how many people come to an event, or what we might offer um, in the future. Or you know, maybe we'll give lampreys a second chance now that I've talked them up. Right? So um, this event cost us over well over $1,000 to put on, not the bad event, but the speaker series. Patagonia and Freeport helps us by donating a few items to incentivize a uh, door prize raffle. Uh, the odds were substantially better about a half an hour ago. Uh, but uh, I'm going to pass this around, write your name on a piece of paper, put the paper in the tin, throw like five bucks or so or something in, in the basket, and we'll have a, a drawing at the end. And I thank, thank Patagonia for doing that. If you don't want to be eligible, you can just pass it on, but we, we do appreciate your support. So... Um, before I forget, uh, I will, will just say that our next event is, uh, these are always the second Wednesday of the month, October through May, is going to be solar energy for me or for Maine. Uh, Representative Seth Berry from Bodenham and Dylan Voorhees from the Natural Resource Council of Maine. Many of you may be aware that um, solar energy has been having a tough time in our legislature lately, with the governor and the legislature. Um, I know CMP all too well over the, some issues over the last few years, and they are just like that with a lot of the legislators. So it's going to be an interesting presentation. That'll be right here as well. Um, Steve Pelletier and, and Trevor Peterson. Steve is back there with the beard, and Trevor next to him. Um, Steve used to be a board member with Friends of Mary Meaning Bay. He's been around for a long time, uh, ran a very successful business, Woodlot Alternatives. Uh, was sold to Stantec, an environmental consulting firm in Canada a number of years ago. Uh, as he says, he does bugs and bunny work in an ever-changing world of technology. Uh, Steve's a certified wildlife biology, a licensed forester. He's been doing this over 30 years, looking at trees, plants, creepy crawly things in the mud. You should come to Bay Day more, Steve, except you're never here. <laughs> and, um, so sometimes scaly, sometimes dead. Um, he's worked as a, wild, a wildlife biologist for U.S. Forest Service. Uh, conducted enforcement work for the DEP, and uh, as I mentioned, was, uh, he was co-founder of Woodlot Alternatives. Um, Steve's regularly involved in habitat and rare species assessments uh, for a variety of development and conservation purposes. He's been an expert witness uh, and done a lot of third-party reviews in Canada and the U.S. I think most of, most of Stantec's work now involves wind issues, but not all of it. Um, Steve's design, Steve has designed and managed avian and bat studies throughout the U.S., utilized a variety of tools and techniques, including X-band and NEXRAD radars, infrared, thermal, and acoustic technologies, and he has served as principal investigator of a six-year offshore acoustic bat study in the Gulf of Maine, Mid-Atlantic Coast, and Great Lakes region on behalf of the U.S. Department of Energy. And actually, Steve did a program on bats offshore here a number of years ago. I, I can't remember how many years. Um, but you found some really interesting stuff out there. Um, Steve's a curr currently the senior principal and uh, U.S. ecological lead at Stantec and uh, is on a number of boards around the country and state. Trevor Peterson works as a biologist and project manager at Stantec in Topsom, where and he specializes in work relating to renewable energy projects, bat migration, rare species assessment, since joining the company in 2003, uh, his project experience has included vernal pool quality and ecological monitoring, spotted turtle inventory and telemetry, natural community characterization, acoustic bat surveys, breeding bird surveys, vegetation monitoring, and raptor surveys. Hi, Tom. Um, Trevor has an undergraduate degree in biology and environmental studies from da 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 da, -da Bowden. Uh, and is a PhD candidate at UMaine uh, in the Ecology and Environmental Science program where his research is focusing on long-term acoustic bat survey data to study their migration and predict potential impacts from land-based and offshore wind projects. Before Stantec, Trevor worked seasonally uh, for the Park Service at Acadia and Isle Royale in Lake Superior and as an island caretaker for MIDA, Maine Island Trail Association. Steve, I'm going to pass my little wireless mic to you, and then you can carry on and pass it on like the Olympics relay. All right, I'll run away. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming. It is 
Hall uh, Halloween? No, Valentine's Day. Um, that's kind of a you big gotta, deal. You gotta speak up, okay? Before you use the mic. Um, that, but, that's mics for my camera, not for them. But anyways, um, I appreciate people coming. When Ed first called and said, "Would you come and do a talk on bats?" I was like, "Sure, this is easy. We, you know, we've been working with bats for a for quite for quite a number of years. Um, basically, uh, we work do a lot of, as as environmental consultants. We work on a lot of different projects by chance." Um, you know, a good portion of that has been working with the wind industry, and it's not we're pro or con with the idea is to go out and collect objective data on on what the effects of of, of building these things are on anything. And and in the studies of birds that we were originally doing, um, there was it became apparent down in uh, West Virginia and Maryland that there was uh, a, a number of bats getting killed when they were people were doing these studies on, underneath. They're doing. To use, uh, surveys under the turbines to see, you know, what kind of uh, mortality was going on with birds, and there was a time in 2004 where all of a sudden they noticed several hundred bats showing up, and it was a big surprise. What's what's going on? Why are why are bats? No one even was thinking about that, and that, the work that had been done with bats back back then was pretty anecdotal by you know some eclectic people scattered around, but I dare say since since then. Um, there's been so much work that's going on, and, and what our learning curve of with bats has been since 2004, particularly because of trying to address these issues, uh, you know, has been phenomenal. We've learned so much, and 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 we we were pretty much one of the first to hear. Can you yes, thank you. thank you. We we were pretty much one of the first in uh, here to start doing a lot of acoustic studies um, using, and the first ones were. Uh, a detectors that were handheld detectors that we uh, we would set up so that we could passively collect information, leave them there, and and come back and collect data over time. And and since then, with this first detector and we've everything that we could possibly do wrong with it, um, we've we've learned how to operate these things fairly efficiently. And I'd say we've got several hundred thousand nights of data in North America by now about bats, and it's all, most of it, a good portion of it is species specific. So we've learned a lot about trends, when they occur, what, under what kinds of conditions they occur. And, um, and so it's been a very interesting process. I could talk about bats all night, but the, is the, what the process has involved um, a lot of good data uh, assessments, analysis, organization. Trevor came on early and it was quick uh, to a lot of the studies we were designing and picked up a lot of what we were doing. And I dare say now he, um, he is, uh, there's not many people in North America that know have as much data at his fingertips. That's a lot of it that we've collected about what bats have done. And his ability to analyze these things, to, to, and I can ask questions, and he's got a lot of the times so the ability to look to see if the data support the hypothesis that we might have. And, and, um, and it's not fair for me to get up here and tell you a bunch of stories when I got somebody that I go to on a daily basis and say, Trevor, um, what did we see in here? So I, I, I really do feel it's more appropriate that we hear directly from from uh, pass the baton to Trevor and let him go at it. I think you want to use the mic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Steve and, and Ed, and for all of you to, for coming out tonight to hear about a topic that I spend most of my time working on. And uh, not knowing what kind of a crowd this would be, I came prepared as well with my, my fat shirt. So, uh, um, so I'm safe here. Let's see. Um, so yeah, as Steve said, we, we as consultants spend a lot of time collecting, going out to a site and collecting data on that particular site for a permitting process. And what we see, having done this many, many times at many projects, are a lot of patterns that really don't show up on each individual project. And so part of the reason that, that I'm currently in, a, in graduate school is because a lot of this information really does, doesn't get out unless somebody puts it all together. So it's all there in various little reports squirreled away sitting on binders that people may or may not ever read. But we saw an opportunity in some of the data that we were collecting to really do something more with it and try to figure out some large-scale regional patterns. And 
And it's really interesting to be able to work on a project that, that spans, you know, at this point we started, I think the first bat detector I ever put out was in uh, somewhere in northern New Hampshire in 2004. So now we're going on 14 years worth of these types of studies where we've done literally hundreds of these surveys each season since then from northern Maine to California, Texas. So most, most of the work that I'll be talking about tonight is in Maine and New England. But it, it really gives you an opportunity to see into the, the lives of a, of a species, a group of species that are they're very difficult to study and they're just, they go unnoticed most of the time. So I'm, uh, I'm glad that you're out here and interested as well. And, uh, and I'll try to keep, what I do, I, I mostly make graphs for a living. I spend a lot of time making graphs and I tried very hard to not put graphs in this because I know they're not generally that exciting to people. I think there's three or four which are hopefully I think they're important for illustrating the point, but most of what I want to do is, is provide a little bit of background on the bats themselves, so some of their natural history, some of the interesting things about them, and how that leads into some of the, the issues that are really relevant for bats today. So, first, happy Valentine's Day again. And this is a, a picture, I mean, it's hard to make bats. Oftentimes they're not presented in a very good way. And so this is a nice close-up of a northern long-eared bat which up until recently would have been one of the more common species you'd find flying around, you know, anywhere in Brunswick, out in the woods in particular. You can tell where it gets its name. Um, but this, these weigh, these are some of the smallest bats around. They weigh just a few grams. Um, obviously very large ears. Like all bats in Maine, they have pretty sharp teeth. They're insectivorous. Um, globally, there's about 1,240, I believe, species of bats that are currently known. So it's the second most diverse order of mammals, second only to rodents. Um, they have tremendous species diversity in part because they occupy a relatively unique niche, being the only mammals that are capable of flight. And, and bats really are different types of flyers. The, the, the nearest thing to them, so it's something like a flying squirrel, is really very unrelated to the type of flight that, that bats are capable of. So this is just a, a generic illustration of a bat. They're, they're essentially a large airfoil. Basically their entire body is one big wing and it's highly maneuverable. The, the structure of the wing is actually fingers just like you have. So if you, if you hold your hands out like this, that's essentially what a bat wing is. Their thumbs stick out the top and then the four fingers form the structure of the wing. So these would be, these are bones and they have the same number of digits that, that you and I do. And actually developmentally a, a bat wing starts out almost identical to a mouse foot. So as the embryos develop they're very similar and there's a certain gene that causes the, the tissue between the, the bones to break down that's inhibited in bat development that allows the wing to form. And then another gene gets expressed that elongates their fingers. So developmentally they're, they're much more closely related to um, rodents and, and um, mice in particular. But their wing really is, just like you can form a fist, a bat can change the shape of its wing dramatically to allow it to fly in very different types of flight and highly maneuverable flight. They also have, most bats have a little tail flap that connects, this is actually a tail, and it's connected to the feet with another flap of skin. Some species of bat called the free-tailed bats don't have that, and so their tail, as the name implies, just hangs back. Their elbow is there. Tail. I put some of these in. These are the, the ways that bat biologists tell bats apart. A lot of it has to do with the color of the fur, whether the tail membrane has fur on it, the length of their ears, length of this forearm. It's, it's actually difficult. It, it, certain bats you can tell in the wing because they're, they're colored. For example, red bats are pretty bright red. Um, there's a, a couple people in the country, really in the world, that can take a spotlight and see a bat and identify it flying, but otherwise you've got to get out a ruler, you've got to really work pretty hard to figure out what species of bat you're looking at. Um, and then even, even down to whether or not it has toe hair and whether the toe's hair is longer than the toes is a dif differentiating feature between a bat that's federally endangered and one that's not. At this point, they're all pretty rare, but um, it, it, it gets quite difficult to tell these guys apart. Um, and this is, I thought, well, you can kind of, this is an interesting photo of a bat wing that actually shows all the blood vessels throughout the wing. So it's, their wings are living tissue, unlike 
bird feathers, and there's a lot of blood vessels there in the wings. It partly serves to, to dissipate heat as they're flying because flight takes, creates an immense amount of metabolic heat. So the wings serve the, the purpose of the kind of like a radiator almost, to let that, letting that heat dissipate. Um, a lot of times people assume that bats, you know, they can fly, but they're maybe not very good at flying compared to birds. Uh, partly because when you see them, they're sort of fluttering around a little bit. It's difficult to get a good look at a flying bat the way you can a bird. But um, a recent paper actually showed that bats can actually fly faster than the fastest horizontally flying bird, I believe the common swift, has been clocked at about 112 kilometers per hour. And a study out in Texas following free-tailed bats um, documented 160 kilometer per hour flight, horizontal flight, not diving, sustained horizontal flight. So that's right around 100 miles per hour. And those species regularly commute 50 to 100 miles a day from their caves just to eat. So they, bats are phenomenally efficient flyers. They can also eat while they're flying, so they're, they're well suited for, for migrating. They're, they're not just sort of these poorly adapted critters that, that are flying around at night. And, and again, sort of building on this, there's this conception that bats are a little bit clumsy. And this is a, I have to go over, this is a movie of a, so the thing in the middle of the screen is a moth that's tied to a piece of fishing line. And you'll see, so that's, this is a red bat, eastern red bat. It actually catches the insect with its tail, flips over and uses its tail to kind of toss the, the moth into its mouth. So again, this, you can only see this in, in slowed, down, um, slowed down footage. And of course the sound that's playing is, is, we only hear it because it's going through an ultrasonic detector. So definitely not clumsy. <clears throat> now I'll spend most of, most of what I talk about, most of what I know about bats comes from detecting them acoustically. And I, I've been recently reading a book written by Donald Griffin, who, who I'll talk more about later, that, that provides a really interesting history of how we discovered how bat, what echolocation is. And um, the, the whole, the, the initial inspiration for this talk came from a curiosity of, you know, what bats were in this building. This is the uh, Pownabral Courthouse over in Dresden, um, a place where I have never actually been. And it, looking at these pictures makes me really want to go visit. But it's right along the Kennebec River. It's a very large old building, and I actually found these plans, and it's, it's been visited by uh, historically interesting people. John Adams was there, Benedict Arnold stopped by on his way up to Quebec, and it also it turns out to be a favorite place for bats to hang out. All this nice place up in the attic, there's plenty of spots to get in and out for a bat. And these guys can get in and out of a hole that's about as big around as your thumb, so there's plenty of thumb-sized holes in a, in a building like this. And so they contacted Steve and asked, you know, can you, can you help us figure out what's going on with bats there? And so we, we put out some bat detectors, which is generally the easiest way to figure out what's going on. So these devices that, that I use on a daily basis uh, have really evolved a lot. They've developed very dramatically in the last 10 years. Um, but the history of how they were created is, is very interesting. And it, it's worth a little side note. So this, this fellow, Lazzaro Spallanzani, was an Italian scientist um, that lived in the late 1700s. He, he was best known for disproving the theory of spontaneous generation. He felt very strongly. He was an empirical biologist. He said you know, he wanted to experiment and try to figure out what was going on. And he had occasion to be in a dark room with an owl and found that the owl was crashing into the walls, couldn't see, couldn't fly. Um, but he knew from experience that bats didn't have the same problem. And so he spent years doing very meticulous experiments where he would experiment to see whether bats could fly when they were blinded, when they had a hood over their heads they couldn't, presumably couldn't see. But he went so far as using opaque hoods versus translucent hoods. And he found that various combinations of these things, as long as their ears were uncovered, they could fly without any, is any issue at all, even if their sight was completely removed. So he contacted some of his his fellow researchers and asked them to perform the same sorts of experiments. And a, a fellow named, um, to write this, a Swiss researcher, I want to get his name right, um, Louis Jurin, 
from Geneva did the same experiment, and he actually went a little bit further to plug their ears with wax. And he found that, that even when their eyesight was perfectly fine, they were completely unable to fly when there was wax in their ears. And he put little tubes in the ears to, to make sure it wasn't just the physical presence of this wax. So he concluded, he said, this doesn't make any sense at all, but they, they seem to use their hearing to navigate, to navigate and avoid obstacles. And both of them thought this was a ridiculous result. How could this possibly be? But that's what, that's what our, our experiments suggest. Um, this fellow, George Cuvier, was an eminent, an extremely influential biologist in France. He, among other things, he was Surgeon General to Napoleon. And he said, that's ridiculous. It's completely just a, how could you possibly think that hearing is being used for navigation? Without doing any experiments, he simply said, you know, it, they, they must have some kind of sense of touch. They have some elaborate sense of touch that we don't understand. Couldn't possibly be their hearing. This was even, even though, um, Spallanzani had noted that if you varnish a bat, it can still fly around just fine. So Spallanzani had spent a lot of time <laughs> working on this. So basically, you know, even though this um, Cuvier had never done any experiments with bats, his influence was such that people actually believed this for 150 years. So when, uh, when Donald Griffin was an undergrad at Harvard, that's what he grew up thinking, you know, that it, there must be some kind of sensory, some sort of hairs on their wings that are able to sense air currents and figure out you know, how to get around. So that was the, the thought, the dominant thought for, for many years. Um, one other character actually that came before Donald Griffin was um, around the time that the Titanic sank, there was a lot of interest in trying to figure out, is there any way we can, you know, a ship could, could see obstacles at night and avoid them? And so this was sort of the precursor to, to radar and sonar. Um, and so he, a guy named Henry Maxim, I believe, who also coincidentally invented the machine gun, one of his side projects was to figure out, to design some kind of low frequency radar that would trigger a bell that would cause a ring. So he kind of thought that maybe bats are doing something similar with low frequency sound. But at any rate, when uh, Donald Griffin was at Harvard, one of his, his fellow students had a machine that could listen to ultrasonic sound. And Donald Griffin was doing some work with bats, and they said, well, why don't you bring your bats over and we'll see if, they, you know, if we can hear anything. And they released a bat and made this you know, torrent of sound, all sorts of clicks and pops, and just fascinating numbers of sounds. And so they, they knew they were on to something. But even them, even at this point, um, they figured, okay, maybe it's some sort of coarse sense of obstacle avoidance. But nobody really thought that echolocation could actually allow a bat to capture a flying insect until substantially later through, you know, again, a lot of experimentation, they realized that um, this sense of echolocation is, is a phenomenally complicated and complex sense that allows bats to really do some incredible things. And I was at a conference last spring for the, a symposium on echolocation research. And it's been really interesting because a lot of the contemporary research and a lot of the technology that's out there now is going and essentially proving or able to test hypotheses that Donald Griffin had, you know, in the in the mid in the mid to late 50s and 60s. So he was really a pioneering scientist, and all of the bells and whistles and tools that we have now are enabling us to to test some of these ideas that that early echolocation researchers had. Um, one thing that it's a little bit of a side note, but I, that I thought was fascinating at this symposium that a lot of people are now putting out arrays of of detectors, you can, you can model the three-dimensional flight of a bat. And they can find that one bat will actually follow another and listen to that bat's echolocation without making any noise itself. So they can kind of follow the other one, sneak in right behind at the very last minute, swoop in and grab the moth. And I tried to find a, a video of this, but it's, I couldn't find anything online. But it, it's a phenomenal sense, and it really enables bats to, to do some miraculous things. And, a lot of times I'm meeting, you know, fishermen, and they, a lot of, any fly fisherman has an anecdote of, you know, being able to have bats follow their flies, yet never crash into the, the line. So all of this, you know, the, as people knew more about echolocation and could see what bats could do, uh, it was shocking that, that bats would collide with windows, for example, or wind turbines. And some actually very recent research is showing that, you know, that the sensory perception of bats can be fooled by certain things, and in particular vertical um, glass windows 
in a way, kind of are invisible to them because they're not used to seeing, they, they're used to seeing water on the horizontal surface and they, you know, they often, they, you can use their echolocation to swoop down and drink. But when, when a vertical surface is smooth, they seem unable to detect it. And there's some really interesting work now doing, comparing different textured surfaces um, and, and really interesting videos of bats just flying clear into a, into a, into a vertical pane. So actually some of the most contemporary work on wind energy is trying to put uh, a textured coating on the turbines that might make them more visible, essentially. Um, so I, I thought that side note of how echolocation was discovered, it was kind of an interesting lesson of, of the, the dangers that can come up when, you know, the, when influential people don't necessarily have the right information. So, um, and partly the other reason echolocation research was so difficult is the technology just wasn't there to, to actually monitor the echolocation. It's, it's hard to record things that are really high pitch. What frequencies are we talking about? Okay, that's a perfect segue. So um, in North America, it's basically 12 kilohertz. So you can hear, teenagers can hear probably up to 20 kilohertz. Um, we could do an experiment and see if any, I have a little, thing that makes a, simulates a bat chirp. Um, so when your hearing starts to go, the, the, first, the first parts of it are the very high frequencies. Um, so they're actually malls will, will broadcast all ultrasonic range that teenagers can hear that adults can't as a way to keep them from congregating in various places. Um, but so somewhere between 12 kilohertz and about 120 kilohertz is most, um, most bat noise. So this thing is, I can't even hear it. It's, I'm right next to it. It's possible the battery is dying, but <laughs> much like a bat, the bats are actually phenomenally loud. They're 130 some decibels, but they're completely silent unless you have the right gear. So this is a, an older bat detector that basically hears the ultrasound and steps it down into a range that we can hear. Um, so if we were outside at night, you, this is quite similar to what a bat actually sounds like. And you can tune it to different frequencies. So it, bat detectors really open up a, a world that's impossible to sense otherwise. Um, and while bat detectors that do this have been around a long time, ones that record the bats are relatively new. And here's, I have a couple examples I can, there's actually a, an iPad an iPhone app now that allows you to hear bats and identify them for you. So I have an example of that here, and afterwards, if you want to play with it, I'll, I can fire that up. But, but there's, there's dozens now of commercially available bat detectors out there that let you, you know, in real time, see the, the bat call. They identify it for you. You can record it. Um, in Europe, people have been doing this as a hobby, much like people go bird watching here. Um, bat watching has been popular there for a long time. It's really only in places like Austin where you have a millions of bats in a bridge that, that that happens in the US. But, but these detectors really are quite phenomenal and they, they allow us as researchers to go out and passively monitor bat activity over a long period of time. So they named that one after you? <laughs> it's got two, an extra T and an extra S, but, but yeah, that, there's a Swedish company, um, I think Lars Pedersen, who's, he's been making these detectors for for years and years. And I think that's still kind of the gold standard of lab quality ones. There's a company in, in Concord, Massachusetts, Wildlife Acoustics, that's been making bird recorders for years. And they've really gotten into the bat, bat monitoring. And they're the ones that make the, the iPhone adapter. So actually several libraries in Maine, and I believe Maine Audubon, has kits available that they can loan out to schools. And they can even, I think they have iPads and, and that device that that schools can borrow. Because most of these are still 800 to $1,000. So it's not something that you know, most people will go out and get. But um, they are very useful for a, for a program if you're bringing kids out in the woods. So this is what we did at, at Pownoboro. We put a bat detector out in, just in the yard next to the house. And the microphone is up here above this little arbor. Um, and we ran it for two or three weeks in about a week in July and then two weeks in September. And what we found were lots and lots of big brown bats. So we recorded about 8,000 calls. So this is what a, 
uh, this is what I spend a lot of time looking at. It's a frequency plot of a bat that's, that's spread out a little bit. So these are basically little chirps. And so this is 25 kilohertz to about 70 kilohertz. So this is well above human hearing. So this, this would be silent even if a bat were right next to your ear. Um, and, and you can identify the bat relatively readily by the, the shape of these, and sort of the shape, the, the frequency, and kind of the distance between them. So there were about 90% of everything we recorded at this site were big brown bats. And it's not surprising now. These are, this is kind of like the blue jay of bats. They're basically everywhere. They're a bit of a generalist. Um, they don't require very specific roost habitats. And these are the kinds of bats that are probably in your attic or garage or barn if you have had bats there. How big are they? They're, I have a slide that shows, they're the only way, I wrote it down, they're like 15 grams. And they're about maybe six or eight inches wingspan. So they're not big in the absolute sense, but compared to other bats, they're large. Um, You've got one in front of you there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so this is actually, this would be bigger than almost any bat. And there'd be some bats in Texas that would be that big. And actually a hoary bat, this, these guys, approach this size wingspan. So the largest bat in Maine and, and New England is a hoary bat. We did record 50 or 60 of these. So maybe two or three percent of all the calls. And we recorded eastern red bats. Again, these were maybe just a handful of, of activity. And so these three species were really it. There were a couple files that the, the computer auto identifier said were silver haired bats. Um, but I looked at them and I don't really think any of them actually were silver haired bats. These are difficult to distinguish from big browns acoustically. So of these three species, the silver haired, eastern red, and the hoary bat, these are three migratory species. So they do not hibernate the way that, that most bats do. Um, so they'll actually fly down to the southeast and then remain somewhat active all year. Um, big brown bats will roost a lot of times in buildings. They'll overwinter, sometimes in caves. But um, most of the bats that we know about, the only reason we can count them and estimate their population is because you can go into the caves in winter and count them on the ceiling. So people actually have Nobody knows how many hoary bats there are, or eastern red bats, or silver-haired bats. They know that there's more eastern reds than the other two species, but there really are not. There are no empirical estimates available for these species. And these are the same three species that, are, that comprise 70 to 80 percent of mortality at wind farms. So it's a difficult situation to manage because you don't know, you only have one part of the equation, which is essentially, we know very well what the mortality rates are and patterns, but we don't know how big the pool those are being drawn from. You mentioned in the beginning physical characteristics per side. Per right, yeah. If you have a bat detector, are the calls diagnostic as well? Not? They, they're not diagnostic, but they're, each bat is able to make a call that's unique. So this picture down here is a unique silver-haired call. They're, there's really flat, um, flat frequency, and they're always right around 26 kilohertz. So in, in Maine, the, the only bat that does something like this is a silver-haired bat. If you were in Oklahoma, it could also be a free-tailed bat. But the problem is um, big brown bats and silver-haired bats can be indistinguishable a lot of the time. So if there's you know, two-thirds of the calls, you really can't tell which is which. Um, hoardy bats are a little easier because they have this kind of, this, this isn't a great call. These, this, these are calls from the Pownaboro Courthouse but they have kind of a hook shape because they bounce around a little bit in frequency. Um, so if you stare at enough of these, they do become a little bit different. Eastern red bats look a lot like hoary bats, but they're higher frequency um, acoustically. But again, if you're using a bat detector and you see it, even a glimpse, and it's this, this visually, this bat is very distinct from, from a big brown bat. Um, so here's one of the only graphs. Um, one of the things you can, you can see with acoustic data is, is timing of activity. So the, one of the busiest nights, July 9th, that's where there's no activity at all until the first hour of sunset. And basically from, for the next eight hours, we recorded at least 50 to 100 calls every, every hour. That's not a tremendous amount compared to if you were right outside a bat cave, but it's pretty steady activity. Versus later on in September, you had a lot of activity and then kind of nothing and a little bit of a burst right before sunset. 
Um, so there's a tremendous amount of variability in bat behavior that you can start to see with, with these sorts of detectors. And most of the time, this kind of variability gets aggregated into a, into a metric, like how many bat calls did you record per night during this particular year. So some of the, the interesting patterns kind of go away when you aggregate the data, but you're able to look at other things. And if I were looking at my presentation, if I could have seen it into the future from 10 years ago, I would have concluded something, this must be just a mistaken graph because there's, none of, there's no myota species in either of these graphs. In fact, we didn't record a single um, myota. So little brown bat or east, uh, northern long-eared bat would be the two that I'd expect. Um, and that's really the story of, that's the, the local proof that the effects of white nose syndrome, which I'll skip this for now. So this is a now famous picture taken in 2006 of bats in a cave in Albany showing this characteristic fungus that's growing on their noses. Um, and this, this disease was, was it's, it, it was brought from Europe somehow, nobody quite knows how, but it was a novel fungus that had never been in North America. And Evidently, the bats, the cave hibernating species, had never encountered it. And we've seen anywhere from 90 to 99 percent decline in the populations of affected species. So this is the little brown bat. Um, so these, these two down here. Little brown bat, the northern long-eared bat, tricolored bat as well, and then to some extent the eastern small-footed bat. So formerly, the little brown bat was no question the most common bat out there in the landscape in the Northeast. Um, and and they're, they're virtually absent now. You still occasionally record one, but it's, it's an utter shift in, in species composition, whereas now big brown bats are everywhere. And it's probably not that their population has increased, it's just that the, the sheer absence of these species has utterly changed the, it would be like if you watched the sign and there were no more chickadees and all you saw were robins everywhere. So it's a fundamental shift in the bat species composition. And we really have no idea what that is doing. It's undoubtedly having an effect on the insect fauna and everything else because little brown bats and big brown bats are ecologically quite different. But nobody has a, really has a clue what, what different shifts are going on in the communities, in the ecological communities that bats are a part of. Um, and this slide is also just useful to see the relative sizes these are the, it's all the same drawing, just scaled up and down. All of these bats share more or less the same morphology, but I need to update it because hoary bats actually have longer, their wings are longer relative to their body length, um, much, that, much like birds do. So again, these, these, the yellow circled guys are the migratory bats. The green are the big brown bats, which are primarily what you hear now so if you did have a bat detector, if you see a bat flying around in the evening, almost certainly it's a big brown bat at this point, whereas it almost certainly would have been a little brown bat 10 years ago. Small-footed bats are a bit of an anomaly. They roost in rocky talus slopes. So the best place to be near a small-footed bat is to go hiking in Acadia. There's probably bats, they're probably everywhere in the park, but you rarely would you ever see them unless you're very patient in the evening to watch them pop out of the rocks. But even if you were sitting there and one came out of the rocks at your feet, you might not notice it. They're, they're very cryptic and small. So eight species of bats in Maine. And again, compared to mammals, there aren't too many groups of mammals that have this kind of diversity, um, other types of mammals in Maine. So the, the species, again, that are affected by white nose that would have been common, that just aren't here, little brown bats, the northern long-eared bat. This is now has been listed as federally threatened, which again, when I first started doing wind energy work, I was talking to a, a consultant in Pennsylvania that does a lot of mist netting, handling bats. And I asked him, because you know, he had done unprecedented amounts of mist netting for various coal, oil and gas work and wind work in Pennsylvania. He said, well, you know, what are you noticing by doing all this work? And he said, you know, there's just a lot of northern long-eared bats. And, you know, that was in 2005. You know, white nose was discovered two years later. So again, the, the landscape has really shifted. Tricolored bats, again, you can kind of look acoustically. This pattern, extremely vertical sorts of calls compared to these. You know, this, so the, these are, would be ones that are relatively easy to tell apart acoustically. 
And then the last, the eastern small-footed bat. This is the smallest. These weigh as little as four grams. Very little, tiny bats. But again, they're able to migrate substantial distances and, and cover an immense amount of territory. So I have a series of slides. This is kind of the, the sad progression of white nose syndrome. So again, it was discovered near, near Albany, New York in 2005. And then each year, it's, it's spread. When it was first discovered, people recognized immediately the importance of, not, of having biologists not transfer it from one cave to another. So there are a lot of decontamination procedures that people did. Despite all of that, the fungus spread extremely quickly, undoubtedly on the bats themselves. So this kind of gives you a sense of how far these bats are moving. In 2009, it popped up west of the Mississippi for the first time, spread up. In 2010 was really when it first entered Maine in the Maritimes. Um, it keeps filling out the range. And this is based entirely on, on cave data, sort of confirmed cases. 2013, 14, and 2015, it made a big jump out to Washington. And I haven't figured out, and I haven't heard any theories of how it made that jump, um, but it's definitely been confirmed there. So each year it has been spreading. Notably, it hasn't shown up down here in these um, south, the southwest are where these huge caves of free-tailed bats are. Um, it, it's a cold loving fungus, so it may not actually make it there. So this is the, the primary graph I'm showing you. And all of the information we have on white nose comes from cave counts. But what's actually happening on the landscape is a lot easier to determine with bat detectors. So this is, every dot here is a study like the one we did at Poundleboro, where we have a detector or several detectors running for anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. And the size of the dot is how many bats calls we recorded. So anywhere from a few hundred to 15,000 plus. And over here, the height of the dot is what proportion were myotis, these species that are white nose affected. So most of these dots are up here, like 75 to 100 percent of all the bat calls were myotis. This is up through 2010. Are these at possible turbine sites? Or yeah, most of these are, this is all in Maine. Most of it is probably proposed wind projects. Some of it is, we did some work at the Cadence River Preserve. It, but most of this is proposed wind projects. Um, white nose arrived in Maine in around 2011. And then post-2011, there's really a, an abrupt shift where now fewer than 10% and as close to 0% are, are myotis. And, and this absence of any points up here for the last four years is, is quite telling because it's not for lack of surveying. There's, there's thousands of nights of surveys represented in these dots. So that's the Poundleboro data set. Again, zero myotis recorded despite having eight, eight to 9,000 calls recorded. These green dots, this is actually data from the Cadence River Preserve where we've, we've put detectors for a number of years, and you can kind of see the same story happening there. So we're really, anywhere you put a bat detector now, you're seeing the evidence of this, this um, unprecedented disease. I don't think there's ever been a case where a mammal species has gone from nearly ubiquitous on the landscape to nearly absent in only five to six years. And again, researchers really don't have any idea what that's doing to the insect community. And, and this is the kind of place that's not where the music note came from. <laughs> but if you had put a bat detector out here previously, you'd recorded tens of thousands of little brown bat calls just flying along the river foraging. And now the, the complete absence of bats undoubtedly is affecting insect populations. And who, what that does to, uh, to the food chain, really nobody, nobody knows yet. Um, it has a lot of people scratching their heads, though, because this is a figure from a study in 2011 that estimated the economic importance of bats. So red in, indicates a per county benefit up to you know, $773 million in ecosystem survey, services provided by bats. So this would be basically pest control. Um, most notably, the corn webworms down in Texas are a favorite food of free-tailed bats. But if you think about Maine and, for example, the spruce budworm, people don't really know to what extent bats would have eaten the the um, moth adults, but presumably it was part of their diet. So there's a lot at stake in terms of a, an entire group of bats vanishing from the landscape. Um, again, the species that are, that are migratory over here, the green ones, 
are, are essentially immune from white nose. They, no, they, they, it doesn't seem to get on the bats. It doesn't seem to affect them. Similarly, big brown bats seem unaffected by the fungus. So there are still bats out there. It's just a fundamentally different group of bats. Um, and I, I, I want to just talk briefly about bat migration and then, and then have time for questions. And this is, again, this is the kind of information we can get from aggregating acoustic data. So each little dot, this is from 2011, so I actually need to update it. Each little dot represents a place where we were listening for bats. And empty circles means we didn't detect any. So this is just silver-haired bats in April. And what, what you'll see is kind of a, a continental movement of these bats across the seasons. So in May, you're starting to see some activity down here in the mid-Atlantic. This is West Virginia here and Maine up there. In June, there's really, we detect them at every site and quite in quite high numbers down here. In July, it sort of evens out. There's a few places where we didn't detect them. And then August, there's a lot more. What's happening is basically the bats are moving through in the spring, going actually north of here for July during the pup rearing season. And then in August and September, they come back. So in September, everything kind of lights up. And virtually anywhere we've ever put a bat detector in September, we record silver-haired bats, hoary bats, and eastern red bats. Even though they don't really live here, they're just on their way through. But this is the time of year. This is when risk is present at wind projects. This is where you might actually see a silver-haired bat if you look up in the, in the fall. And then October, it really you only have activity down in the southeast. And then by November, there's very little activity left. So again, these types of continental movements of bats are extremely hard to monitor because you either have to track the bat with a radio transmitter, which is logistically nearly impossible, um, or aggregate enough data to try to, to piece together what's going on. And really, the impetus of all this is, again, wind energy. Um, we could talk all night about that. But essentially, there's these three species are quite vulnerable to collision during certain conditions. And that's really what, my, what a lot of our work is, is, is using acoustic detectors now to figure out not only how many bats there are, but when are they up there and under what conditions.